I came to Lincoln about 15, 16 years ago as a lecturer, <coughs> taking loads and loads of students around the cathedral, and we always end up in the Duncan Grant Chapel. So I too have a lot of personal experience of this chapel. And people still find it surprising um, after a tour of basically the medieval cathedral to be in this extraordinary space. So I thought what I'd do today is think about what I know about 19th century ecclesiastical art and actually look for some continuities and contradictions with, with the Grant Chapel. I too am, like Linda, slightly um, confused by the murals. Um, fascinated, I think, is a good response as well. I think they're quite interesting, kind of contradictory um, works of art. So I hope to bring out some of that today. Um, very long scope. I think it's worth remembering that um, there's an enormous legacy of medieval architecture in this country. And successive generations have intervened and reformulated um, with the material culture of medieval in England. Um, these interventions in the fabric of churches, this can be by changing the actual building, by putting new art in the building, often driven and influenced by politics, both religious and secular. There are often tensions evident between local and collective power. Although churches are theoretically public buildings, they're often dominated by a single individual or a small group of people. And this quite often creates tensions. There are also frequently tensions evident between the politics of the artist and the politics of the church. If you like, a church is a building that comes with an ideological direction. And finding an artist to respond appropriately to that can sometimes be problematic. Um, just to gloss that, I've got a couple of images here. <coughs> Some um, Calvinist iconoclasts smashing up stained glass in the 1560s. And I love this stained glass panel. You'll hear quite a lot about stained glass today because I've worked a fair bit on stained glass. Um, this is a Flemish glass painter, Abraham van Linger. This um, panel comes with its own health warning. It was created during the, the Laudian High Church revival within the Anglican Church. And the inscription on the bottom of the panel says the truth here is genuine, historical, but not superstitious. It's basically saying this story is in the Bible, so <coughs> don't smash me. So this is a work of art that's actually saying I'm all right. Um, talking about the 19th century, when we're talking about Duncan Grant, may seem a bit weird, but I'm trying to convince you there are some quite interesting points of continuity. In the Spalding biography, here there, there's a quote here from Duncan Grant. For years I would ask God on my knees at prayers to allow me to become a, as good a painter as he. This is about Burne Jones, and on your right there you can see one of Burne Jones' great windows from Birmingham Cathedral. Um, and Grant's murals are historicist, as the publication Linda's been talking about has, has pointed out. And to me, I don't know whether I'm alone in this, they also seem part of a craft tradition. There's very much the signature of the maker all over the, the murals. They're not illusionistic and highly finished in the way that some art is. And so I think they speak to a craft tradition as well. Grant is also active at the peak of Anglo-Catholicism. We think of the High Church revival within the Church of England as something much earlier, but it actually peaks around the First World War, which is very much kind of done. Grant an interesting phase of his career. And this is significant because the anglo Catholic revival generated commissions for a lot of ecclesiastical art. But Grant is also part of the critique of the 19th century. He's part of the modernist rejection of Victorianism, and he's part of the reformulation of craft through the Omega workshops. So here's a, a, an Omega table with a, so a water lily pattern by Duncan Grant. This is a very, very different object from those um, created by the arts and crafts movement. So now I'm just going to run through some background for 19th century ecclesiastical design. And I guess one of the things we might associate with it is a large scale industry. So here I'm showing you catalogues from church furnishers. So this is a large scale sector driven by the boom in church building. Um, entire church in interiors could be purchased by catalogue. In fact, I found one catalogue where you could purchase an entire iron church complete. Um, <laughs> on the, on the um, left there you've got a catalogue from Whipple that's um, Exeter I'm interested there because that's where I did my PhD on the, on the right a page from John Hardman and Co's catalogue big Birmingham church furnishing manufacturer who famously um, worked with Poochie in the late 40s early 50s 
I love this image. Um, this is a picture of Whipple's Church Furnishing Warehouse in Exeter in about 1907. Um, apparently he had four or five floors, so it gives you some sense of the scale of the 19th century church furniture industry. I think this is quite an interesting context to thinking about Grant. This is early 20th century, not in the middle of the 19th century. So this is big, big, big business by the early 20th century. And just to actually kind of drive that home, um, this nice design here for a, a, a big Reredos. Um, this is Bodley, as in GF Bodley, <coughs> one of his later partnerships, Bodley and Hare. If I showed you that without the date, you might stick it somewhere in the 1860s, 1870s. Mm. It's 1925, okay? So one of the things I'm saying to you today, a lot of this church art we think of as Victorian is very much around Duncan Grant when he's making interesting work. Okay, another little angle here, and I'm trying to pick out angles which I think speak to, to, to Grant's murals. Um, the Victorian church decorating industry isn't as big and monumental and uniform as you may think, and to prove that, I'm going to show you some work of some amateur glass painters. This is from Bingham in Nottinghamshire, about 30 or 40 miles down the road. Um, this window was painted by Mary Miles, who was married to the rector. Um, she created a number of windows in the church. Here's another one. They are incredibly individualistic in the way they use Christian imagery. Um, she was um, heavily involved in the making process. She corresponded with a Bristol-based glass painter called Joseph Bell. Um, he sent her brushes, paints, glass. She painted them, sent them back to Bristol. He fired them, sent them back up to Nottinghamshire, had them put in. And if you walk into Bingham Church and do go, there's five or six windows by Mary Miles there that say all sorts of interesting things with the iconography. <coughs> so the idea that politicised making started with the arts and crafts movement, I think, is just not true. Um, even closer to home, this is Nocton, only about four miles away, North Isle East window. This was designed by Louisa Hobart as a memorial to her sister um, and cousin and niece. Their portraits are actually in the window. Warden Hughes, the company there, a big Victorian stained glass manufacturer. But these are highly individualised, personalised cultural products within the Victorian church furnishing industry. And to finish off this, this idea about amateurs, um, there are 25 windows in Lincoln Cathedral made by the Sutton brothers. These are a pair of clergymen. Their father was one of the richest men in England. And they made a whole series of windows. Um, they had a stained glass kiln built in the bottom of their garden. And again, it's an extraordinary kind of um, innovative amateur operation. You might notice here, um, the Sutton brothers are much more archaeological. They're scholars of medieval art. And you can see their fi figure work is quite consciously archaic. Now, I guess we're more used to thinking of this sort of activity in the context of the arts and crafts movement. So I thought I'd finish this section with a, a little church in Devon. This is Ermington down in Devon. And here, two well-known architects, J.D. and Edmund Sedding, worked with Violet Rushley and Ethel Pinwell, who were the daughters of the vicar. And they carved most of the woodwork in the church. So this pulpit you can see was actually carved by them. And there you can see a detail. And actually, Rushley Pinwell, <coughs> made a transition, transition to becoming a, a professional and apparently when she died in 1957 her work was in over 300 Devon churches so this is another perspective on the Victorian church furnishing industry which I think is interesting in the context of today. Now there was if you like a professional reaction against